Caught on the Ebb Tide by Edward P. Rowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Light Many Waters. Caught on the Ebb Tide. The August morning was bright and fair, but Herbert Schofield's brow was clouded. He had wandered off to a remote part of the grounds of a summer hotel on the Hudson and seated in the shade of a tree had lapsed into such deep thought that his cigar had gone out and the birds were becoming bold in the vicinity of his motionless figure it was his vacation time and he had come to the country ostensibly for rest as the result he found himself in the worst state of unrest that he had ever known minnie madison a young lady he had long admired was the magnet that had drawn him hither her arrival had preceded his by several weeks and she had smiled a little consciously when in looking at the hotel register late one afternoon his bold chirography met her eye there are so many other places to which he might have gone she murmured her smile however was a doubtful one not expressive of gladness and entire satisfaction in mirthful saucy fashion her thoughts ran on the time has come when he might have a respite from business does he still mean business by coming here i'm not sure that i do although the popular idea seems to be that a girl should have no vacation in the daily effort to find a husband i continually disappoint the good people by insisting that the husband must find me i have a presentiment that mr schofield is looking for me but there are some kinds of property which cannot be picked up and carried off nolens volens when found schofield had been animated by no such clearly defined purpose as he was credited with when he sought the summer resort graced by miss madison his action seemed to him tentative his motive ill-defined even in his own consciousness yet it had been strong enough to prevent any hesitancy he knew he was weary from a long year's work he purposed to rest and take life very leisurely and he had mentally congratulated himself that he was doing a wise thing in securing proximity to miss madison she had evoked his admiration in new york excited more than a passing interest but he felt that he did not know her very well in the unconventional life now in prospect he could see her daily and permit his interest to be dissipated or deepened as the case might be while he remained in the strictest sense of the word uncommitted it was a very prudent scheme and not a bad one he reasoned justly this selecting a wife is no bagatelle a man wishes to know something more about a woman than he can learn in a drawing-room or at a theatre party but now he was in trouble he had been unable to maintain this judicial aspect he had been made to understand at the outset that miss madison did not regard herself as a proper subject for deliberate investigation and that she was not inclined to aid in his researches so far from meeting him with engaging frankness and revealing her innermost soul for his inspection he found her as elusive as only a woman of tact can be when so minded even at a place where people meet daily it was plain to him from the first that he was not the only man who favored her with admiring glances and he soon discovered that young merriweather and his friend hackley had passed beyond the neutral ground of non-committal he set himself the task of learning how far these suitors had progressed in her good graces he would not be guilty of the folly of giving chase to a prize already virtually captured this too had proved a failure clearly would he know what mr merriweather and mr hackley were to miss madison he must acquire the power of mind-reading each certainly appeared to be a very good friend of hers a much better friend than he could claim to be for in his case she maintained a certain unapproachableness which perplexed and nettled him after a week of rest observation and rather futile effort to secure a reasonable share of miss madison's society and attention he became assured that he was making no progress whatever so far as she was concerned but very decided progress in a condition of mind and heart anything but agreeable should the affair continue so one-sided he had hoped to see her daily and was not disappointed he had intended to permit his mind to receive such impressions as he should choose and now his mind asked no permission whatever but without volition occupied itself with her image perpetually he was not sure whether she satisfied his preconceived ideals of what a wife should be or not for she maintained such a firm reticence in regard to herself that he could put his little finger on no affinities she left no doubt as to her intelligence but beyond that she would not reveal herself to him he was almost satisfied that she discouraged him utterly and that it would be wiser to depart before his feelings became more deeply involved at any rate he had better do this or else make love in dead earnest which course should he adopt there came a day which brought him to a decision a party had been made up for an excursion into the highlands miss madison being one of the number 
She was a good pedestrian and rarely missed a chance for a ramble among the hills. Schofield's two rivals occasionally got astray with her in the perplexing wood roads, but he never succeeded in securing such good fortune. On this occasion, as they approached a woodchopper's cottage, or rather hovel, there were sounds of acute distress within, the piercing cries of a child evidently in great pain. There was a moment of hesitancy in the party, and then Miss Madison's graceful indifference vanished utterly. As she ran hastily to the cabin, Schofield felt that now, probably, was a chance for more than mere observation, and he kept beside her. An ugly cur sought to bar the entrance, but his vigorous kick sent it howling away. She gave him a quick, pleased look as they entered. A slatternly woman was trying to soothe the little boy, who at all her attempts only writhed and shrieked the more. "'I don't know what ails the young one,' she said. "'I found him a moment ago yelling at the foot of a tree. Some this matter with his leg.' "'Yes,' cried Miss Madison, delicately feeling of the member, an operation which, even under her gentle touch, caused increased outcry. "'It is evidently broken. Let me take him on my lap.' And Schofield saw that her face had softened into the tenderest pity. "'I will bring a surgeon at the earliest possible moment,' exclaimed Schofield, turning to go. Again she gave him an approving glance, which warmed his heart. "'The ice is broken between us now,' he thought, as he broke through the group gathering at the open door. Never before had he made such time down a mountain, for he had a certain kind of consciousness that he was not only going after the doctor, but also after the girl. Securing a stout horse and wagon at the hotel, he drove furiously for the surgeon, explained the urgency, and then, with the rural healer at his side, almost killed the horse in returning. He found his two rivals at the cabin door, the rest of the party having gone on. Miss Madison came out quickly. An evanescent smile flitted across her face as she saw his kindled eyes and the reeking horse, which stood trembling and with bowed head. His ardor was a little dampened when she went directly to the poor beast and said, "'This horse is a rather severe indictment against you, Mr. Schofield. There was need of haste, but—' And she paused significantly. "'Yes,' added the doctor, springing out. "'I never saw such driving. It's lucky your necks are not broken.' "'You are all right, doctor, and ready for your work,' Schofield remarked brusquely. "'As for the horse, I'll soon bring him around.' And he rapidly began to unhitch the overdriven animal. "'What are you going to do?' Miss Madison asked curiously. "'Rub him into as good shape as when he started.' She turned away to hide a smile as she thought, "'He has waked up at last.' The boy was rendered unconscious, and his legs speedily put in the way of restoration. "'He will do very well now if my directions are carried out strictly,' the physician was saying when Schofield entered. Mr. Merriweather and Mr. Hackley stood rather helplessly in the background and were evidently giving more thought to the fair nurse than to the patient. The mother was alternating between lamentations and invocations of good on the young leddy's head. Finding that he would come in for a share of the latter, Schofield retreated again. Miss Madison walked quietly out, and looking critically at the horse, remarked, "'You have kept your word very well, Mr. Schofield. The poor creature does look much improved.' She evidently intended to continue her walk with the two men in waiting, for she said demurely, with an air of dismissal, "'You will have the happy consciousness of having done a good deed this morning.' "'Yes,' replied Schofield, in significant undertone. "'You of all others, Miss Madison, know how inordinately happy I shall be in riding back to the village with the doctor.' She raised her eyebrows in a little well-feigned surprise at his words, then turned away. During the remainder of the day he was unable to see her alone for a moment, or to obtain any further reason to believe that the ice was, in reality, broken between them. But his course was no longer non-committal, even to the most careless observer. The other guests of the house smiled, and Mr. Merriweather and Mr. Hackley looked askance at one, who threw their assiduous attentions quite into the shade. Miss Madison maintained her composure, was oblivious as far as possible, and sometimes, when she could not appear blind, looked a little surprised and even offended. He had determined to cast prudence and circumlocution to the winds. On the morning following the episode in the mountains, he was waiting to meet her when she came down to breakfast. "'I've seen that boy, Miss Madison, and he's doing well.' "'What? So early? You are a very kind-hearted man, Mr. Schofield.' "'About as the average. That you are kind-hearted, I know.' at least to everyone except me, for I saw your expression as you examined the little fellow's injury yesterday. You thought only of the child. I hope you did also, Mr. Schofield, she replied with an exasperating look of surprise. You know well I did not, he answered bluntly. I thought it would be well worth while to have my leg broken if you would look at me in the same way. Truly, Mr. Schofield, I feel you are not as kind-hearted as I supposed you to be. And then she turned to greet Mr. Merriweather. 
won't you let me drive you up to see the boy interposed schofield boldly i'm sorry but i promised to go up with the doctor this morning and so affairs went on he thought at times her color quickened a little when he approached suddenly he fancied that he occasionally surprised a half wistful half mirthful glance but was not sure he knew that she was as well aware of his intentions and wishes as if he had proclaimed them through a speaking trumpet his only assured ground of comfort was that neither mr merriweather nor mr hackley had yet won the coveted prize though they evidently were receiving far greater opportunities to push their suit than he had been favored with at last his vacation was virtually at an end but two more days would elapse before he must be at his desk again in the city and now we will go back to the time when we found him that early morning brooding over his prospects remote from observation what should he do propose by letter no he said after much cogitation i can see that little affected look of surprise with which she would read my plain declaration of what she knows so well shall i force a private interview with her the very word force which i have unconsciously used teaches me the folly of this course she doesn't care a rap for me and i should have recognized the truth long ago i'll go back to the hotel and act toward her precisely as she has acted toward me i can then at least take back to town a little shred of dignity he appeared not to see her when she came down to breakfast after the meal was over he sat on the piazza engrossed in the morning paper an excursion party for the mountains was forming he merely bowed politely as she passed him to join it but he ground his teeth as he saw merriweather and hackley escorting her away when they were out of sight he tossed the paper aside and went down to the river purposing to row the fever out of his blood he was already satisfied how difficult his tactics would be should he continue to see her and he determined to be absent all day so to tire himself out that exhaustion would bring early sleep on his return weary and leaden-spirited enough he was as late in the afternoon he made his way back but firm in sudden resolve to depart on an early train in the morning and never voluntarily to see the obdurate lady of his affections again just as the sun was about sinking he approached a small wooded island about half a mile from the boat-house and was surprised to notice a rowboat high and dry upon the beach "'Someone has forgotten that the tide is going out,' he thought, as he passed, but it was no affair of his. A voice called faintly, "'Mr. Schofield!' He started at the familiar tones and looked again. Surely that was Miss Madison standing by the prow of the stranded skiff. He knew well indeed it was she, and he put his boat about with an energy not in keeping with his former language strokes. Then, recollecting himself, he became pale with the self-control he purposed to maintain." she is in a scrape he thought and calls upon me as she would upon any one else to get her out of it weariness and discouragement inclined him to be somewhat reckless and brusque in his words and manner under the compulsion of circumstances she who would never graciously accord him opportunities must now be alone with him but as a gentleman he could not take advantage of her helplessness or plead his cause and he felt a sort of rage that he should be mocked with an apparent chance which was in fact no chance at all his boat stranded several yards from the shore throwing down his oars he rose and faced her was it the last rays of the setting sun which made her face so rosy or was it embarrassment i'm in a dilemma mr schofield miss madison began hesitatingly and you would rather be in your boat he added that would not help me any seeing where my boat is i have done such a stupid thing i stole away here to finish a book and well i didn't notice that the tide was running out i'm sure i don't know what i'm going to do schofield put his shoulder to an oar and tried to push his craft to what deserved the name ashore but could make little headway he was glad to learn by the effort however that the black mud was not unfathomable in depth hastily reversing his action he began pushing his boat back in the water surely mr schofield you did not intend to leave me began miss madison surely not he replied but then since you are so averse to my company i must make sure that my boat does not become as fast as yours on this ebb tide otherwise we should both have to wait till the flood oh beg pardon now i understand but how can you reach me wade he replied coolly proceeding to take off his shoes and stockings what through that horrid black mud i couldn't leap that distance miss madison it's too bad i'm so provoked with myself the mud may be very deep or there may be quicksand or something in which case i should merely disappear a little earlier and he sprang overboard up to his knees dragged the boat till it was sufficiently fast in the ooze to be stationary then he waded ashore well she said with a little deprecatory laugh it's a comfort not to be alone on a desert island 
indeed can i be welcome under any circumstances truly mr schofield you know that you were never more welcome it's very kind of you any man would be glad to come to your aid it is merely your misfortune that i happen to be the one i'm not sure that i regard it as a very great misfortune you proved in the case of that little boy that you can act very energetically and get lectured for my intemperate zeal well miss madison i cannot make a very pleasing spectacle with blackamoor legs and it's time i put my superfluous energy to some use suppose you get in your boat and i'll try to push it off she complied with a troubled look in her face he pushed till the veins knotted on his forehead at this she sprang out exclaiming you'll burst a blood vessel that's only a phase of a ruptured heart and you are used to such phenomena it's too bad for you to talk in that way she cried it certainly is i will now attend strictly to business i don't see what you can do carry you out to my boat that is all i can do oh mr schofield can you suggest anything else she looked dubiously at the intervening black mud and was silent i could go up to the hotel and bring mr merriweather and mr hackley she turned away to hide her tears or i could go after a brawny boatman but delay is serious for the tide is running out fast and the stretch of mud growing wider can you not imagine me mike or tim or some fellow of that sort no i can't then perhaps you wish for me to go for mike or tim but the tide is running out so fast you said yes and it will soon be dark oh dear and there was distress in her tones he now said kindly miss madison i wish that like sir walter raleigh i had a mantle large enough for you to walk over you can at least imagine that i am a gentleman that you may soon be at the hotel and no one ever be any the wiser that you had to choose between me and the deep ah uh, well mud there is no reason for such an illusion mr schofield well then that you had no other choice that's better but how in the world can you manage it you will have to put your arm around my neck oh you would put your arm around a post wouldn't you he asked with more than his old brusqueness yes but but the tide is going out my own boat will soon be fast dinner will grow cold at the hotel and you are only the longer in dispensing with me you must consider the other dire alternatives oh i forgot that you were in danger of losing a warm dinner you know i have lost too much to think of that or much else but there is no need of satire miss madison i will do whatever you wish that truly is carte blanche enough even for this occasion i didn't mean to be satirical i-i well have your own way not if you prefer some other way you have shown that practically there isn't any other way i'm sorry that my misfortune or fault rather should also be your misfortune you don't know how heavy i soon will and you must endure it all with such grace as you can put your arm around my neck so oh that will never do well you'll hold tight enough when i'm floundering in the mud without further ado he picked her up and started rapidly for his boat stepping on a smooth stone he nearly fell and her arm did tighten decidedly if you try to go so fast she said you will fall i was only seeking to shorten your ordeal but for obvious reasons must go slowly and he began feeling his way mr schofield am i not very heavy she asked softly not as heavy as my heart and you know it i'm sure i no you are not to blame moths have scorched their wings before now and will always continue to do so her head rested slightly against his shoulder her breath fanned his cheek her eyes soft and lustrous sought his but he looked away gloomily and defiant and she felt his grasp tighten vise-like around her i shall not affect any concealment of the feelings which she has recognized so often nor shall i ask any favors he thought there he said as he placed her in his boat you are safe enough now now go aft while i push off when she was seated he exerted himself almost as greatly as before and the boat gradually slid into the water he sprang in and took the oars aren't you going to put on your shoes and stockings certainly when i put you ashore won't that be a pretty certain way of revealing the plight in which you found me pardon my stupidity i was preoccupied with the thought of relieving you from the society which you have hitherto avoided so successfully and bending over his shoes he tied them almost savagely there was a wonderful degree of mirth and tenderness in her eyes as she watched him they had floated by a little point and as he raised his head he saw a form which he recognized as mr merriweather rowing toward them there comes one of your shadows he said mockingly be careful how you exchange boats when he comes alongside i will give you no help in such a case she looked hastily over her shoulder at the approaching oarsman i think it will be safer to remain in your boat she said oh it will be entirely safe he replied bitterly mr merriweather must have seen you carrying me that's another thing which i can't help 
Mr. Schofield, she began softly. He arrested his oars and turned wondering eyes to hers. They were sparkling with mirth as she continued. Are you satisfied that a certain young woman whom you once watched very narrowly is entirely to your mind? He caught her mirthful glance and misunderstood her. With dignity he answered, I'm not the first man who blundered to his cost, though probably it would have made no difference. You must do me the justice, however, to admit that I did not maintain the role of observer very long, that I wooed you so openly that every one was aware of my suit. Is it not a trifle cruel to taunt me, after I have made such ample amends? I was thinking of Mr. Merriweather. Undoubtedly. Since he has seen me with my arm around your neck, you know I couldn't help it. Well, perhaps he might row the other way if, if, well, if he saw you, what shall I say, sitting over here by me? Or somehow I don't feel very hungry, and I wouldn't mind spending another hour. Schofield nearly upset the boat in his precipitous effort to gain a seat beside her, and Mr. Merriweather did row another way. End of Caught on the Ebb Tide by Edward P. Rowe read by like many waters Charon by Lloyd Dunsany recorded by Tony Scheinman This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Charon by Lloyd Dunsany Charon leaned forward and rowed. All things were one with his weariness. It was not with him a matter of years or of centuries, but of wide floods of time, and an old heaviness and a pain in the arms that had become for him part of the scheme that the gods had made, and was of a peace with eternity. If the gods had even sent him a contrary wind, it would have divided all time in his memory into two equal slabs. So gray were all things always where he was, that if any radiance lingered a moment among the dead, on the face of such a queen perhaps as Cleopatra, his eyes could not have perceived it. It was strange that the dead nowadays were coming in such numbers. They were coming in thousands where they used to come in fifties. It was neither Charon's duty nor his wont to ponder in his gray soul why these things might be. Charon leaned forward and rode. Then no one came for a while. It was not usual for the gods to send no one down from earth for such a space, but the gods knew best. Then one man came alone, and the little shade sat shivering on a lonely bench, and the great boat pushed off. Only one passenger. The gods knew best, and great and weary Charon rode on and on beside the little silent shivering ghost. And the sound of the river was like a mighty sigh that grief in the beginning had sighed among her sisters, and that could not die like the echoes of human sorrow failing on earthly hills, but was as old as time and the pain in Charon's arms. Then the boat from the slow gray river loomed up to the coast of Dis, and the little silent shade, still shivering, stepped ashore, and Charon turned the boat to go wearily back to the world. Then the little shadow spoke that had been a man. I am the last, he said. No one had ever made Charon smile before. No one before had ever made him weep. End of Charon by Lloyd Dunsany The Oriental Tale of the Cobbler Astrologer Told by Charles John Tibbets This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana in October 2018. The Cobbler Astrologer 
in the great city of isfahan lived ahmed the cobbler an honest and industrious man whose wish was to pass through life quietly and he might have done so had he not married a handsome wife who although she had condescended to accept of him as a husband was far from being contented with his humble sphere of life Sitara, such was the name of ahmed's wife was ever forming foolish schemes of riches and grandeur and though ahmed never encouraged them he was too fond a husband to quarrel with what gave her pleasure an incredulous smile or a shake of the head was his only answer to her often told day-dreams and she continued to persuade herself that she was certainly destined to great fortune it happened one evening while in this temper of mind that she went to the hammam where she saw a lady retiring dressed in a magnificent robe covered with jewels and surrounded by slaves this was the very condition sitara had always longed for and she eagerly inquired the name of the happy person who had so many attendants and such fine jewels she learned it was the wife of the chief astrologer to the king with this information she returned home her husband met her at the door but was received with a frown nor could all his caresses obtain a smile or a word for several hours she continued silent and in apparent misery at length she said cease your caresses unless you are ready to give me a proof that you do really and sincerely love me what proof of love exclaimed poor ahmed can you desire which i will not give give over cobbling it is a vile low trade and never yields more than ten or twelve dinars a day turn astrologer your fortune will be made and i shall have all i wish and be happy astrologer cried ahmed astrologer have you forgotten who i am a cobbler without any learning that you want me to engage in a profession which requires so much skill and knowledge i neither think nor care about your qualifications said the enraged wife all i know is that if you do not turn astrologer immediately i will be divorced from you to-morrow the cobbler remonstrated but in vain the figure of the astrologer's wife with her jewels and her slaves had taken complete possession of sitara's imagination all night it haunted her she dreamt of nothing else and on awaking she declared she would leave the house if her husband did not comply with her wishes what could poor ahmed do he was no astrologer but he was dotingly fond of his wife and he could not bear the idea of losing her he promised to obey and having sold his little stock bought an astrolabe an astronomical almanac furnished with these he went to the market-place crying i am an astrologer i know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac i can calculate nativities i can foretell everything that is to happen no man was better known than ahmed the cobbler a crowd soon gathered round him what friend ahmed said one have you worked till your head is turned are you tired of looking down at your last cried another that you are now looking up at the planets these and a thousand other jokes assailed the ears of the poor cobbler who notwithstanding continued to exclaim that he was an astrologer having resolved on doing what he could to please his beautiful wife it so happened that the king's jeweller was passing by he was in great distress having lost the richest ruby belonging to the crown every search had been made to recover the inestimable jewel but to no purpose and as the jeweller knew he could no longer conceal its loss from the king he looked forward to death as inevitable in this hopeless state while wandering about the town he reached the crowd around ahmed and asked what was the matter <laughs> don't you know ahmed the cobbler said one of the bystanders laughing he has been inspired and has become an astrologer well a drowning man will catch at a broken reed the jeweller no sooner heard the sound of the word astrologer than he went up to ahmed told him what had happened and said if you understand your art you must be able to discover the king's ruby do so and i will give you two hundred pieces of gold but if you do not succeed within six hours i will use all my influence at court to have you put to death as an impostor poor ahmed was thunderstruck 
he stood long without being able to move or speak reflecting on his misfortunes and grieving above all that his wife whom he so loved had by her envy and selfishness brought him to such a fearful alternative full of these sad thoughts he exclaimed aloud o oh, woman woman thou art more baneful to the happiness of man than the poisonous dragon of the desert well the lost ruby had been secreted by the jeweller's wife who disquieted by those alarms which ever attend guilt sent one of her female slaves to watch her husband this slave on seeing her master speak to the astrologer drew near and when she heard ahmed after some moments of apparent abstraction compare a woman to a poisonous dragon she was satisfied that he must know everything she ran to her mistress and breathless with fear cried you are discovered my dear mistress you are discovered by a vile astrologer before six hours are past the whole story will be known and you will become infamous if you are even so fortunate as to escape with life unless you can find some way of prevailing on him to be merciful she then related what she had seen and heard and ahmed's exclamation carried as complete conviction to the mind of the terrified mistress as it had done to that of her slave the jeweller's wife hastily throwing on her veil went in search of the dreaded astrologer when she found him she threw herself at his feet crying spare my honour and my life and i will confess everything what can you have to confess to me exclaimed ahmed in amazement oh nothing nothing with which you are not already acquainted you know too well that i stole the ruby from the king's crown i did so to punish my husband who uses me most cruelly and i thought by this means to obtain riches for myself and to have him put to death but you most wonderful man from whom nothing is hidden have discovered and defeated my wicked plan i beg only for mercy and will do whatever you command me an angel from heaven could not have brought more consolation to ahmed than did the jeweller's wife he assumed all the dignified solemnity that became his new character and said woman i know all thou hast done and it is fortunate for thee that thou hast come to confess thy sin and beg for mercy before it was too late return to thy house put the ruby under the pillow of the couch on which thy husband sleeps let it be laid on the side furthest from the door and be satisfied thy guilt shall never be even suspected the jeweller's wife returned home and did as she was desired in an hour ahmed followed her and told the jeweller he had made his calculation and found by the aspect of the sun and the moon and by the configuration of the stars that the ruby was at that moment lying under the pillow of his couch on the side furthest from the door the jeweller thought ahmed must be crazy but as a ray of hope is like a ray from heaven to the wretched he ran to the couch and there to his joy and wonder found the ruby in the very place described he came back to ahmed embraced him called him his dearest friend and the preserver of his life and gave him the two hundred pieces of gold declaring that he was the first astrologer of the age these praises conveyed no joy to the poor cobbler who returned home more thankful to god for his preservation than elated by his good fortune the moment he entered the door his wife ran up to him and exclaimed well my dear astrologer what success there said ahmed very gravely there are two hundred pieces of gold i hope you will be satisfied now and not ask me again to hazard my life as i have done this morning he then related all that had passed but the recital made a very different impression on the lady from what these occurrences had made on ahmed sitara saw nothing but the gold which would enable her to vie with the chief astrologer's wife at himam courage she said courage my dearest husband this is only your first labour in your new and noble profession go on and prosper and we shall become rich and happy in vain ahmed remonstrated and represented the danger she burst into tears and accused him of not loving her ending with her usual threat of insisting upon a divorce ahmed's heart melted and he agreed to make another trial accordingly next morning he sallied forth with his astrolabe his twelve signs of the zodiac and his almanac 
exclaiming as before i am an astrologer i know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac i can calculate nativities i can foretell everything that is to happen a crowd again gathered round him but it was now with wonder and not ridicule for the story of the ruby had gone abroad and the voice of fame had converted the poor cobbler ahmed into the ablest and most learned astrologer that was ever seen at isfahan while everybody was gazing at him a lady passed by veiled she was the wife of one of the richest merchants in the city and had just been at the hammam where she had lost a valuable necklace and earrings she was now returning home in great alarm lest her husband should suspect her of giving her jewels to a lover seeing the crowd around ahmed she asked the reason of their assembling and was informed of the whole story of the famous astrologer how he had been a cobbler was inspired with supernatural knowledge and could with the help of his astrolabe his twelve signs of the zodiac and his almanac discover all that ever did or ever would happen in the world the story of the jeweller and the king's ruby was then told to her accompanied by a thousand wonderful circumstances which had never occurred the lady quite satisfied of his skill went up to ahmed and mentioned her loss saying a man of your knowledge and penetration will easily discover my jewels find them and i will give you fifty pieces of gold the poor cobbler was quite confounded and looked down thinking only how to escape without a public exposure of his ignorance the lady in pressing through the crowd had torn the lower part of her veil ahmed's downcast eyes noticed this and wishing to inform her of it in a delicate manner before it was observed by others he whispered to her lady look down at the rent the lady's head was full of her loss and she was at that moment endeavouring to recollect how it could have occurred ahmed's speech brought it at once to her mind and she exclaimed in delighted surprise stay here a few moments thou great astrologer i will return immediately with the reward thou so well deservest saying this she left him and soon returned carrying in one hand the necklace and earrings and in the other a purse with the fifty pieces of gold there is gold for thee she said thou wonderful man to whom all the secrets of nature are revealed i had quite forgotten where i laid the jewels and without thee should never have found them but when thou desirest me to look at the rent below i instantly recollected the rent near the bottom of the wall in the bathroom where before undressing i had hid them i can now go home in peace and comfort and it is all owing to thee thou wisest of men after these words she walked away and ahmed returned to his home thankful to providence for his preservation and fully resolved never again to tempt it his handsome wife however could not yet rival the chief astrologer's lady in her appearance at the hammam so she renewed her entreaties and threats to make her fond husband continue his career as an astrologer about this time it happened that the king's treasury was robbed of forty chests of gold and jewels forming the greater part of the wealth of his kingdom the high treasurer and other officers of state used all diligence to find the thieves but in vain the king sent for his astrologer and declared that if the robbers were not detected by a stated time he as well as the principal ministers should be put to death only one day of the short period given them remained all their search had proved fruitless and the chief astrologer who had made his calculations and exhausted his art to no purpose had quite resigned himself to his fate when one of his friends advised him to send for the wonderful cobbler who had become so famous for his extraordinary discoveries two slaves were immediately dispatched for ahmed whom they commanded to go with them to their master you see the effects of your ambition said the poor cobbler to his wife i am going to my death the king's astrologer has heard of my presumption and is determined to have me executed as an impostor on entering the palace of the chief astrologer he was surprised to see that dignified person come forward to receive him and lead him to the seat of honour and not less so to hear himself thus addressed the ways of heaven most learned and excellent ahmed are unsearchable the high are often cast down and the low are lifted up 
the whole world depends upon fate and fortune it is my turn now to be depressed by fate it is thine to be exalted by fortune his speech was here interrupted by a messenger from the king who having heard of the cobbler's fame desired his attendance poor ahmed now concluded that it was all over with him and followed the king's messenger praying to god that he would deliver him from his peril when he came into the king's presence he bent his body to the ground and wished his majesty long life and prosperity tell me ahmed said the king who has stolen my treasure hmm it was not one man answered ahmed after some considerations there were forty thieves concerned in the robbery very well said the king but who were they and what have they done with my gold and my jewels these questions said ahmed i cannot answer now but i hope to satisfy your majesty if you will grant me forty days to make my calculations i grant you forty days said the king but when they are past if my treasure is not found your life shall pay the forfeit ahmed returned to his house well pleased for he resolved to take advantage of the time allowed him to fly from a city where his fame was likely to be his ruin well ahmed said his wife as he entered what news at court no news at all said he except that i am to be put to death at the end of forty days unless i find forty chests of gold and jewels which have been stolen from the royal treasury but you will discover the thieves how by what means am i to find them by the same art which discovered the ruby and the lady's necklace the same art replied ahmed foolish woman thou knowest that i have no art and that i have only pretended to it for the sake of pleasing thee but i have had sufficient skill to gain forty days during which time we may easily escape to some other city and with the money i now possess and the aid of my former occupation we may still obtain an honest livelihood <gasps> an honest livelihood repeated his lady with scorn will thy cobbling thou mean spiritless wretch ever enable me ever to go to the hammam like the wife of the chief astrologer hear me ahmed think only of discovering the king's treasure thou hast just as good a chance of doing so as thou hadst of finding the ruby and the necklace and the earrings at all events i am determined thou shalt not escape and shouldst thou attempt to run away i will inform the king's officers and have thee taken up and put to death even before the forty days are expired thou knowest me too well ahmed to doubt my keeping my word so take courage and endeavour to make thy fortune and to place me in that rank of life to which my beauty entitles me oh the poor cobbler was dismayed at this speech but knowing that there was no hope of changing his wife's resolution he resigned himself to his fate well said he your will shall be obeyed all i desire is to pass the few remaining days of my life as comfortably as i can you know i am no scholar and have little skill in reckoning so there are forty dates give me one of them every night after i have said my prayers that i may put them in a jar and by counting them may always see how many of the few days i have to live are gone the lady pleased at carrying her point took the forty dates and promised to be punctual in doing what her husband desired meanwhile the thieves who had stolen the king's treasure having been kept from leaving the city by fear of detection and pursuit had received accurate information of every measure taken to discover them one of them was among the crowd before the palace on the day the king sent for ahmed and hearing that the cobbler had immediately declared their exact number he ran in a fright to his comrades and exclaimed we are all found out ahmed the new astrologer has told the king that there are forty of us Pah. there needed no astrologer to tell that said the captain of the gang this ahmed with all his simple good nature is a shrewd fellow forty chests have been stolen he naturally guessed that there must be forty thieves and he has made a good hit that is all still it is prudent to watch him 
for he certainly has made some strange discoveries one of us must go to-night after dark to the terrace of this cobbler's house and listen to his conversation with his handsome wife for he is said to be very fond of her and will no doubt tell her what success he has had in his endeavours to detect us everybody approved of this scheme and soon after nightfall one of the thieves repaired to the terrace he arrived there just as the cobbler had finished his evening prayers and his wife was giving him the first date ah said ahmed as he took it there is one of the forty the thief hearing these words hastened in consternation to the gang and told them that the moment he took his post he had been perceived by the supernatural knowledge of ahmed who immediately told his wife that one of them was there the spy's tale was not believed by his hardened companions something was imputed to his fears he might have been mistaken in short it was determined to send two men the next night at the same hour they reached the house just as ahmed having finished his prayers had received the second date and heard him exclaim my dear wife to-night there are two of them the astonished thieves fled and told their still incredulous comrades what they had heard three men were consequently sent the third night four the fourth and so on being afraid of venturing during the day they always came as evening closed in and just as ahmed was receiving his date hence they all in turn heard him say that which convinced them he was aware of their presence on the last night they all went and ahmed exclaimed aloud the number is complete to-night the whole forty are here all doubts were now removed it was impossible that ahmed should have discovered them by any natural means how could he ascertain their exact number and night after night without ever once being mistaken he must have learnt it by his skill in astrology even the captain now yielded in spite of his incredulity and declared his opinion that it was hopeless to elude a man thus gifted he therefore advised that they should make a friend of the cobbler by confessing everything to him and bribing him to secrecy by a share of the booty his advice was approved of and an hour before dawn they knocked at ahmed's door the poor man jumped out of bed and supposing the soldiers were come to lead him to execution cried out have patience i know what you are come for it is a very unjust and wicked deed most wonderful man said the captain as the door opened we are fully convinced that thou knowest why we are come nor do we mean to justify the action of which thou speakest here are two thousand pieces of gold which we will give thee provided thou wilt swear to say nothing more about the matter say nothing about it said ahmed do you think it possible i can suffer such gross wrong and injustice without complaining and making it known to all the world have mercy on us exclaimed the thieves falling on their knees only spare our lives and we will restore the royal treasure the cobbler started rubbed his eyes to see if he were asleep or awake and being satisfied that he was awake and that the men before him were really the thieves he assumed a solemn tone and said <clears throat> guilty men ye are persuaded that ye cannot escape from my penetration which reaches unto the sun and moon and knows the position and aspect of every star in the heavens your timely repentance has saved you but ye must immediately restore all that ye have stolen go straight away and carry the forty chests exactly as ye found them and bury them a foot deep under the southern wall of the old ruined himam beyond the king's palace if ye do this punctually your lives are spared but if ye fail in the slightest degree destruction will fall upon you and your families the thieves promised obedience to his commands and departed ahmed then fell on his knees and returned thanks to god for this signal mark of his favour about two hours after the royal guards came and desired ahmed to follow them he said he would attend them as soon as he had taken leave of his wife to whom he determined not to impart what had occurred until he saw the result he bade her farewell very affectionately she supported herself with great fortitude on this trying occasion exhorting her husband to be of good cheer and said a few words about the goodness of providence 
but the fact was sitara fancied that if god took the worthy cobbler to himself her beauty might attract some rich lover who would enable her to go to the hammam with as much splendor as the astrologer's lady whose image adorned with jewels and fine clothes and surrounded by slaves still haunted her imagination the decrees of heaven are just a reward suited to the merits awaited ahmed and his wife the good man stood with a cheerful countenance before the king who was impatient for his arrival and immediately said ahmed thy looks are promising hast thou discovered my treasure does your majesty require the thieves or the treasure the stars will only grant one or the other said ahmed looking at his table of astrological calculations your majesty must make your choice i can deliver up either but not both oh i should be sorry not to punish the thieves answered the king but if it must be so i choose the treasure and you give the thieves a full and free pardon i do provided i find my treasure untouched then said ahmed if your majesty will follow me the treasure shall be restored to you the king and all his nobles followed the cobbler to the ruins of the old hammam there casting his eyes towards heaven ahmed muttered some sounds which were supposed by the spectators to be magical conjurations but which were in reality the prayers and thanksgivings of a sincere and pious heart to god for his wonderful deliverance when his prayer was finished he pointed to the southern wall and requested that his majesty would order his attendants to dig there the work was hardly begun when the whole forty chests were found in the same state as when stolen with the treasurer's seal upon them still unbroken the king's joy knew no bounds he embraced ahmed and immediately appointed him his chief astrologer assigned to him an apartment in the palace and declared that he should marry his only daughter as it was his duty to promote the man whom god had so singularly favored and had made instrumental in restoring the treasure of his kingdom the young princess who was more beautiful than the moon was not dissatisfied with her father's choice for her mind was stored with religion and virtue and she had learnt to value beyond all earthly qualities that piety and learning which she believed ahmed to possess the royal will was carried into execution as soon as formed the wheel of fortune had taken a complete turn the morning had found ahmed in a wretched hovel rising from a sorry bed in the expectation of losing his life in the evening he was the lord of a rich palace and married to the only daughter of a powerful king but this change did not alter his character as he had been meek and humble in adversity he was modest and gentle in prosperity conscious of his own ignorance he continued to ascribe his good fortune solely to the favor of providence he became daily more attached to the beautiful and virtuous princess whom he had married and he could not help contrasting her character with that of his former wife whom he had ceased to love and of whose unreasonable and unfeeling vanity he was now fully sensible this ends the tale of the cobbler astrologer as told by charles john tibbets The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman the facts in the case of m valdemar of course i shall not pretend to consider it any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of m valdemar has excited discussion it would have been a miracle had it not especially under the circumstances through the desire of all parties concerned to keep the affair from the public at least for the present, or until we had further opportunities for investigation, through our endeavors to effect this, a garbled or exaggerated account made its way into society, and became the source 
of many unpleasant misrepresentations, and, very naturally, of a great deal of disbelief. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts, as far as I comprehend them myself. They are succinctly these. My attention for the last three years had been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism, and about nine months ago it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had as yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen first whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence. Secondly, whether if any existed it was impaired or increased by the condition. Thirdly, to what extent or for how long a period the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process. There were other points to be ascertained, but these most excited my curiosity. The last, in especial, from the immensely important character of its consequences. In looking around me for some subject by whose means I might test these particulars, I was brought to think of my friend, Monsieur Ernest Valdemar, the well-known compiler of the Bibliotheca Forensica, and author, under the nom de plume, of Issachar Marx, of the Polish versions of Wallenstein and Gargantua. Monsieur Valdemar, who has resided principally at Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person, his lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers, in violent contrast to the blackness of his hair, the latter, in consequence, being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous, and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions I had put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed in other results, which his peculiar constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control, and in regard to clairvoyance, I could accomplish with him nothing to be relied upon. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him, his physicians had declared him in a confirmed phthisis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching dissolution as of a matter neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was, of course, very natural that I should think of M. Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him, and he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. I spoke to him frankly upon the subject, and to my surprise his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, for although he had always yielded his person freely to my experiments, he had never before given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was of that character which would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination in death, and it was finally arranged between us 
that he would send for me about twenty-four hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of his decease. It is now rather more than seven months since I received from M. Valdemar himself the subjoined note. My dear P., you may as well come now. D. and F. are agreed that I cannot hold out beyond to-morrow midnight, and I think they have hit the time very nearly. Signed, Valdemar. I received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in fifteen minutes more I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for ten days, and was appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lustreless, and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbones. His expectoration was excessive. The pulse was barely perceptible. He retained, nevertheless, in a very remarkable manner, both his mental power and a certain degree of physical strength. He spoke with distinctness, took some palliative medicines without aid, and, when I entered the room, was occupied in penciling memoranda in a pocket-book. He was propped up in the bed by pillows. Doctors D. and F. were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand, I took these gentlemen aside and obtained from them a minute account of the patient's condition. The left lung had been for eighteen months in a semi-osseous or cartilaginous state, and was, of course, entirely useless for all purposes of vitality. The right in its upper portion was also partially, if not thoroughly, ossified, while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tubercles, running one into another. Several extensive perforations existed, and at one point permanent adhesion to the ribs had taken place. These appearances in the right lobe were of comparatively recent date. The ossification had proceeded with very unusual rapidity. No sign of it had been discovered a month before, and the adhesion had only been observed during the three previous days. Independently of the phthisis, the patient was suspected of aneurysm of the aorta, but on this point the osseous symptoms rendered an exact diagnosis impossible. It was the opinion of both physicians that M. Valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow, Sunday. It was then seven o'clock on Saturday evening. On quitting the invalid's bedside to hold conversation with myself, doctors D. and F. had bidden him a final farewell. It had not been their intention to return. But at my request they agreed to look in upon the patient about ten the next night. When they had gone, I spoke freely with M. Valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution, as well as, more particularly, of the experiment proposed. He still professed himself quite willing, and even anxious to have it made, and urged me to commence it at once. A male and a female nurse were in attendance, but I did not feel myself altogether at liberty to engage in a task of this character with no more reliable witnesses than these people, in case of sudden accident, might prove. I therefore postponed operations until about eight the next night, when the arrival of a medical student with whom I had some acquaintance, Mr. Theodore L., relieved me from further embarrassment. It had been my design originally to wait for the physicians, but I was induced to proceed, 
first by the urgent entreaties of M. Valdemar, and secondly by my conviction that I had not a moment to lose, as he was evidently sinking fast. Mr. L. was so kind as to accede to my desire that he would take notes of all that occurred, and it is from his memoranda that what I now have to relate is, for the most part, either condensed or copied verbatim. It wanted about five minutes of eight, when, taking the patient's hand, I begged him to state as distinctly as he could to Mr. L., whether he, M. Valdemar, was entirely willing that I should make the experiment of mesmerizing him in his then condition. He replied feebly, yet quite audibly, Yes, I wish it to be. I fear you have mesmerized, adding immediately afterwards, deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead. But although I exerted all my powers, no further perceptible effect was induced until some minutes after ten o'clock, when doctors D and F called according to appointment. I explained to them in a few words what I designed, and as they opposed no objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation, exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones, and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible, and his breathing was stertorous and at intervals of half a minute. This condition was nearly unaltered for a quarter of an hour. At the expiration of this period, however, a natural, although a very deep sigh, escaped the bosom of the dying man, and the stertorous breathing ceased. That is to say, its stertorousness was no longer apparent. The intervals were undiminished. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven I perceived unequivocal signs of the mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was changed for that expression of uneasy inward examination, which is never seen except in cases of sleep-waking and which it is quite impossible to mistake. With a few rapid lateral passes I made the lids quiver, as in incipient sleep, and with a few more I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously, and with the fullest exertion of the will, until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer, after placing them in a seemingly easy position. The legs were at full length, the arms were nearly so, and reposed on the bed at a moderate distance from the loin. The head was very slightly elevated. When I had accomplished this it was fully midnight and I requested the gentleman present to examine M. Valdemar's condition. After a few experiments, they admitted him to be an unusually perfect state of mesmeric trance. The curiosity of both the physicians was greatly excited. Dr. D. resolved at once to remain with the patient all night, while Dr. F. took leave with a promise to return at daybreak. Mr. L., and the nurses remained. We left M. Valdemar entirely undisturbed until about three o'clock in the morning, when I approached him and found him in precisely the same condition as when Dr. F. went away. That is to say, he lay in the same position, 
the pulse was imperceptible, the breathing was gentle, scarcely noticeable, unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still the general appearance was certainly not that of death. As I approached M. Valdemar, I made a kind of half-effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now, but to my astonishment his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. Monsieur Valdemar, I said, are you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about the lips, and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. At its third repetition his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering. The eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of the ball. The lips moved sluggishly, and from between them in a barely audible whisper issued the words, Yes, asleep now. Do not wake me. Let me die so. I here felt the limbs, and found them as rigid as ever. The right arm, as before, obeyed the direction of my hand. I questioned the sleep-waker again. Do you still feel pain in the breast, Monsieur Valdemar? The answer now was immediate but even less audible than before. No pain. I am dying. I did not think it advisable to disturb him farther just then, and nothing more was said or done until the arrival of Dr. F., who came a little before sunrise and expressed unbounded astonishment at finding the patient still alive. After feeling the pulse and applying a mirror to the lips, he requested me to speak to the sleep-waker again. I did so, saying, Monsieur Valdemar, do you still sleep? As before, some minutes elapsed ere a reply was made, and during the interval the dying man seemed to be collecting his energies to speak. At my fourth repetition of the question, he said very faintly, almost inaudibly, Yes, still asleep, dying. It was now the opinion, or rather the wish, of the physicians, that M. Valdemar should be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present apparently tranquil condition until death should supervene, and this, it was generally agreed, must now take place within a few minutes. I concluded, however, to speak to him once more, and merely repeated my previous question. While I spoke, there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleep-waker. The eyes rolled themselves slowly open, the pupils disappearing upwardly, the skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue, resembling not so much parchment as white paper and the circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the centre of each cheek went out at once. I use this expression because the suddenness of their departure 
put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of the breath. The upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth which it had previously covered completely, while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk, leaving the mouth widely extended, and disclosing in full view the swollen and blackened tongue. I presume that no member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors, but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of M. Valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed. I now feel that I have reached a point of this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief. It is my business, however, simply to proceed. There was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in M. Valdemar, and, concluding him to be dead, we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses, when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue. This continued for perhaps a minute. At the expiration of this period there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice, such as it would be madness in me to attempt describing. There are indeed two or three epithets which might be considered as applicable to it in part. I might say, for example, that the sound was harsh and broken and hollow, but the hideous whole is indescribable, for the simple reason that no similar sounds have ever jarred upon the ear of humanity. There were two particulars, nevertheless, which I thought then, and still think, might fairly be stated as characteristic of the intonation as well adapted to convey some idea of its unearthly peculiarity. In the first place, the voice seemed to reach our ears, at least mine, from a vast distance, or from some deep cavern within the earth. In the second place, it impressed me. I fear, indeed, that it will be impossible to make myself comprehended as gelatinous, or glutinous matters impress the sense of touch. I have spoken both of sound and of voice. I mean to say that the sound was one of distinct, of even wonderfully, thrillingly distinct, syllabification. M. Valdemar spoke, obviously in reply to the question I had propounded to him a few minutes before. I had asked him, it will be remembered, if he still slept. He now said, Yes, no, I have been sleeping, and now, now, I am dead. No person present even affected to deny or attempted to repress the unutterable shuddering horror which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey. Mr. L., the student, swooned. The nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return. My own impressions I would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader. For nearly an hour we busied ourselves silently, without the utterance of a word, in endeavors to revive Mr. L. When he came to himself we addressed ourselves again to an investigation of M. Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. I should mention, too, that this limb was no farther subject to my will. 
I endeavored in vain to make it follow the direction of my hand. The only real indication, indeed, of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory movement of the tongue whenever I addressed M. Valdemar a question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. To queries put to him by any other person than myself he seemed utterly insensible, although I endeavored to place each member of the company in mesmeric rapport with him. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleep-waker's state at this epoch. Other nurses were procured, and at ten o'clock I left the house, in company with the two physicians and Mr. L. In the afternoon we all called again to see the patient. His condition remained precisely the same. We had now some discussion as to the propriety and feasibility of awakening him but we had little difficulty in agreeing that no good purpose would be served by so doing. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken M. Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at M. Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical and other friends. All this time the sleep-waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving M. Valdemar from the mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed, as especially remarkable, that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids, of a pungent and highly offensive odor. It was now suggested that I should attempt to influence the patient's arm as heretofore. I made the attempt, and failed. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. M. Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before. And at length the same hideous voice which I have already described broke forth. For God's sake, quick, quick, put me to sleep, or quick, waken me, quick. I say to you that I am dead. I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavor to recompose the patient but failing in this through total abeyance of the will, I retraced my steps, and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least 
I soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. For what really occurred, however, it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared. As I rapidly made the mesmeric passes, amid ejaculations of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer his whole frame at once within the space of a single minute or even less shrunk crumbled absolutely rotted away beneath my hands upon the bed before that whole company there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putridity. End of The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe Recording by Ron Altman The Girl at the Switchboard by William Nelson Taft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The Girl at the Switchboard by William Nelson Taft. When you come right down to it, mused Bill Quinn. Women came as near to winning the late but unlamented war as did any other single factor. The Food Administration placarded their statement that food will win the war, broadcast throughout the country, and that was followed by a whole flock of other claimants, particularly after the armistice was signed. But there were really only two elements that played a leading role in the final victory, men and guns, and women backed these to the limit of their powerful ability, saving food, buying bonds, doing extra work, wearing a smile when their hearts were torn, and going way out of their usual sphere in hundreds of cases, and making good in practically every one of them. So far as we know, the Allied side presented no analogy to Molly Pitcher or the other heroines of past conflicts, for war has made such forward steps that personal heroism on the part of women is almost impossible. Of course, we had Botch Kariva and her Regiment of Death, not to mention Edith Cavill, but the list is not a long one. When it is finally completed, however, there are a few names which the public hasn't yet heard, which will stand well toward the front. For example, there was Virginia Lang. Was she the girl at the switchboard that you mentioned in connection with the Von Ewald case? I interrupted. That's the one, said Quinn, and, what's more, she played a leading role in that melodrama, a play in which they didn't use property guns or cartridges. Miss Lang, continued Quinn, was one of the few women I ever heard of that practically solved a Secret Service case on her own. Of course, in the past, the different governmental detective services have found it to their advantage to go outside the male sex for assistance. There have been instances where women in the employ of the Treasury Department rendered valuable service in trailing smugglers. The matter of the Duville Diamonds is a case in point, and even the Secret Service hasn't been above using women to assist in running counterfeiters to earth, while the archives of the State Department would reveal more than one interesting record of feminine cooperation in connection with underground diplomacy. But in all these cases the women were employed to handle the work, and they were only doing what they were paid for, while Virginia Lang... Well, in the first place, she's one of the girls in charge of the switchboard at the Renock in New York. You know the place, that big apartment hotel in Riverside Drive, 
where the lobby is only a shade less imposing than the bellboys, and it costs you a month's salary to speak to the superintendent. They never have janitors in a place like that. Virginia herself, I came to know her fairly well in the winter of 1917, after Dave Carroll had gone to the front, was well qualified by nature to be the heroine of any story. Rather above the average in size, she had luckily taken advantage of her physique to round out her strength with a gymnasium course. But in spite of being a big woman, she had the charm and personality which are more often found in those less tall. When you couple this with a head of wonderful hair, a practically perfect figure, eyes into which a man could look and, looking, lose himself, lips which would have caused a lipstick to blush, and... Oh, what's the use? Words only caricature a beautiful woman, and besides, if you haven't gotten the effect already, there's nothing that I can tell you that would help any. In the spring of 1916, when the von Ewald case was at its height, Miss Lang was employed at the Renault switchboard, and it speaks well for her character when I can tell you that not one of the bachelor tenants ever tried a second time to put anything over. Virginia's eyes could snap when they wanted to, and Virginia's lips could frame a cutting retort as readily as a pleasant phrase. In a place like the Renault, run as an apartment hotel, the guests changed quite frequently, and it was some task to keep track of all of them, particularly when there were three girls working in the daytime, though only one was on at night. They took it by turns, each one working one week in four at night, and the other three holding down the job from eight till six. So, as it happened, Virginia did not see Dave Carroll until he had been there nearly a month. He blew in from Washington early one evening, and straightway absented himself from the hotel until sometime around seven the following morning, following the schedule right through every night. Did you ever know, Carroll? He and I worked together on the Farron case out in St. Louis, the one where a bookmaker at the races tipped us off to the biggest counterfeiting scheme ever attempted in this country, and after that he took part in a number of other affairs, including the one which prevented the Haitian Revolution in 1913. Dave wasn't what you would call good-looking, though he did have a way with women. The first night that he came downstairs after a good day's sleep and spotted Virginia Lang on the switchboard, he could have been pardoned for wandering over and trying to engage her in a conversation. But the only rise he got was from her eyebrows. They went up in that, I am sure I have never met you, manner, which is guaranteed to be cold water to the most ardent male. And the only reply she vouchsafed was, What number did you wish? You appear to have mine, Dave laughed, and then asked for Rector 2800, the private branch which connected with the service headquarters. When he came out of the booth, he was careful to confine himself to thank you and the payment of his toll. But there was something about him that made Virginia Lang feel he was different, a word which, with women, may mean anything or nothing. Then she returned to the reading of her detective story, a type of literature to which she was much addicted. Carol, as you have probably surmised, was one of the more than two score government operatives sent to New York to work on the von Ewald case. His was a night shift, with roving orders to wander around the section in the neighbourhood of Columbus Circle and stand ready to get anywhere in the upper section of the city in a hurry in case anything broke. But beyond reporting to headquarters regularly every hour, the assignment was not exactly eventful. The only thing that was known about von Ewald at that time was that a person using such a name or alias was in charge of the German intrigues against American neutrality. Already nearly a score of bomb outrages, attempts to destroy shipping, plots against munition plants and the like had been laid at his door. But the elusive Hun had yet to be spotted. 
Indeed, there were many men in the service who doubted the existence of such a person. And of these, Carroll was one. But he shrugged his shoulders and stoically determined to bear the monotony of strolling along Broadway and up past the plaza to Fifth Avenue and back again every night, a program which was varied only by an occasional seance at Risen Weber's or Pabst's, for that was in the days before the one-half of one per cent represented the hypothesis of liquid refreshment. It was while he was walking silently along 59th Street on the north side, close to the park, a few nights after his brush with Virginia Lang, that Carroll caught the first definite information about the case that anyone had obtained. He hadn't noted the men until he was almost upon them, for the night was dark and the operative's rubber heels made no sound upon the pavement. Possibly he wouldn't have noticed them then, if it hadn't been for a phrase or two of whispered German that floated out through the shrubbery. He will stay at Connor's, was what reached Carroll's ears. That will be our chance, a rare opportunity to strike two blows at once, one at our enemy and the other at this smug, self-satisfied nation which is content to make money out of the slaughter of Germany's sons. Once he is in the hotel, the rest will be easy. How? inquired a second voice. A bomb, so arranged to explode with the slightest additional pressure, in a careful growled a third man eight fifty nine would hardly care to have his plans spread all over new york this cursed shrubbery is so dense that there is no telling who may be near come and carroll crouched on the outside of the fence which separates the street from the park knew that seconds were precious if he was to get any further information a quick glance down the street showed him that the nearest gate was too far away to admit of entrance in that manner, so slipping his automatic into the side pocket of his coat, he leapt upwards and grasped the top of the iron fence. On the other side he could hear the quick scuffle of feet as the Germans, alarmed, began to retreat rapidly. A quick upward heave, a purchase with his feet and he was over, his revolver in his hand the instant he lighted on the other side. Halt, he called, more from force of habit than from anything else, for he had no idea that any of the trio would stop. But evidently one of them did, for behind the shelter of a nearby bush came the quick spat of a revolver and a tongue of flame shot toward him. The bullet, however, sung harmlessly past, and he replied with a fusillard of shots that ripped through the bush and brought a shower of German curses from the other side. Then another of the conspirators opened fire from a point at right angles to the first, and the ruse was successful, for it diverted Carroll's attention long enough to permit the escape of the first man, and the operative was still flat on the ground, edging his way cautiously forward when the park police arrived, the vanguard of a curious crowd attracted by the shots. "'What's the trouble?' demanded the sparrow cop. "'None at all,' replied Dave as he slipped the still warm revolver into his pocket and brushed some dirt from his sleeve. Guy tried to hold me out, that's all, and I took a pot shot at him. Cut it! Secret service! And he cautiously flashed his badge in the light of the electric torch which the park policeman held. Huh, grunted the guard as he made his way to the bush from behind which Carroll had been attacked. You evidently winged him. There's blood on the grass here, but no sign of the bird himself. Want any report to headquarters? he added in an undertone. Not a word, said Carroll. I'm working this end of the game, and I want to finish it without assistance. It's the only thing that's happened in a month to break the monotony, and there's no use declaring anyone else in on it. By the way, do you know any place in town known as Connors? Connors? Never heard of it. Sounds as though it might be a dive in the Bowery. Plenty of queer places down there. No, it's hardly likely to be in that section of the city, Dave stated. Farther uptown, I think, but it's a new one on me. On me, too, agreed the guard, and I thought I knew the town like a book. 
When he reported to headquarters a few moments later, Carroll told the chief over the wire of his brush with the trio of Germans, as well as what he had heard. There was more than a quiver of excitement in the voice from the other end of the wire, for this was the first actual proof of the existence of the mysterious number 859. Still believe von Ewald is a myth, inquired the chief. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, was the answer, because the bullet that just missed me was pretty material. Evidently someone is planning these bomb outrages and it's up to us to nab him, if only for the sake of the service. Did you catch the name of the man to whom your friends were alluding? asked the chief. No, they just referred to him as he. That might mean any one of a number of people, mused the chief. Sir Cecil Spring Rice is in town, you know, stopping at the Waldorf. Then there's the head of the French mission at the Vanderbilt with a bunch of people, and Lord Wimbledon, who spent five million dollars for horses in the West, stopping at the same place you are. You might keep an eye on him, and I'll send Kramer and Fleming up to trail the other two. Did you ever hear of the place they call Connors, Chief? No, but that doesn't mean anything. It may be a code word, a prearranged name to camouflage the hotel in the event anyone were listening in. Possibly, replied Carol, just before he hung up, but somehow I have a hunch that it wasn't. I'll get back on the job and let you know if anything further develops. His adventure for the night appeared to have ended, for he climbed into bed the following morning without having been disturbed, but lay awake for an hour or more, obsessed with the idea that he really held the clue to the whole affair, but unable to figure out just what it was. Where was it that they intended to place the bomb? Why would they arrange it so as to explode upon pressure rather than concussion or by a time fuse? Where was Connors, who was the man they were plotting against? These were some of the questions which raced through his brain, and he awoke in the late afternoon still haunted by the thought that he really ought to know more than he did. That night at dinner he noted, almost subconsciously, that he was served by a new waiter, a fact that rather annoyed him because he'd been particularly pleased at the service rendered by the other man. "'Where's Felix?' he inquired as the new attendant brought his soup. "'He isn't on tonight, sir,' was the reply. "'He had an accident and won't be here for a couple of days.' "'An accident?' "'Yes, sir,' was the laconic answer. "'Anything serious?' "'No, sir. He, he hurt his hand, and the waiter disappeared without another word. Carroll thought nothing more of it at the time, but later, over his coffee and a good cigar, a sudden idea struck him. Could it be that Felix was one of the men whom he had surprised the night before, the one he had fired at and hit? No, that was too much of a coincidence. But then Felix was manifestly of foreign origin, and, while he claimed to be Swiss, there was a distinct Teutonic rasp to his words upon occasion. Signalling to his waiter, Dave inquired whether he knew where Felix lived. I'd like to know if there was anything I can do for him, he gave as his reason for asking. I haven't the slightest idea, came the answer, and Carroll was aware that the man was lying, for his demeanour was sullen rather than subservient, and the customary sir was noticeable by its absence. Once in the lobby, Dave noticed that the pretty telephone operator was again at the switchboard, and the idea occurred to him that he might find out Felix's address from the hotel manager or head waiter. I understand that my waiter has been hurt in an accident, the operative explained to the goddess of the wires, and I'd like to find out where he lives. Who would be likely to know? The head waiter ought to be able to tell you, was the reply, accompanied by the flash of what Carol swore to be the whitest teeth he had ever seen. Just a moment, and I'll get him on the wire for you. Then, after a pause, booth number five, please. But Carol got no satisfaction from that source, either, 
the head waiter maintained that he knew nothing of Felix's whereabouts and hung up the receiver in a manner which was distinctly final, not to say impolite. The very air of mystery that surrounded the missing man was sufficient to incline him to the belief that, after all, there might be something to the idea that Felix was the man he had shot at the night before. In the event, it was practically certain that Lord Wimbledon was the object of the German's attention. But that didn't solve the question as to where the bomb was to be placed, nor the location of Connors. Just the same, he muttered half aloud, I'm going to stick around here tonight. Why that momentous decision? came a voice almost at his elbow, a voice which startled and charmed him with its inflection. Looking up, he caught the eyes of the pretty telephone girl laughing at him. "'Talking to yourself is a bad habit,' she warned him with a smile which seemed to hold an apology for her brusqueness of the night before. "'Particularly in your business.' "'My business?' echoed Dave. "'What do you know about that?' "'Not a thing in the world, except—' and here her voice dropped to a whisper, "'Except that you are a government detective and that you've discovered something about Lord Wimbledon, probably some plot against his lordship.' "'Where? How? What in the world made you think that?' stammered Carol, almost gasping for breath. "'Very simple,' replied the girl. "'Quite elementary, as Sherlock Holmes used to say. "'You called the headquarters number every night when you came down.' The other girls tip me off to that, for they know that I am fond of detective stories. Then everybody round here knows that Felix, the waiter that you inquired about, is really German, though he pretends to be Swiss, and that he, the head waiter, and the pastry cook are thick as thieves. You'd hardly expect me to say yes, would you, particularly as I am supposed to be a government operative. Now I know you are, smiled the girl. Very few people use the word operative. They'd say detective or agent. But don't worry, I won't give you away. Please don't, laughed Carol, half banteringly, half in earnest, for it would never do to have it leak out that a girl had not only discovered his identity, but his mission. Then, as an afterthought, do you happen to know of any hotel or place here in town known as Connors, he asked. Why, of course, was the reply, amazing in its directness. The manager's name. But then she halted abruptly, picked up a plug, and said, What number, please? Into the receiver. Carol sensed that there was a reason for her stopping in the middle of her sentence, and, looking round, found the pussy-footed head waiter beside him, apparently waiting for a call. Silently damning the custom that made it obligatory for waiters to move without making a sound, Carol wandered off across the lobby, determined to take a stroll round the block before settling down to his night's vigil. A stop at the information desk, however, rewarded him with the news that Lord Wimbledon was giving a dinner in his apartments the following evening to the British ambassador, that being all the hotel knew officially about His Grace's movements. I'll take care to have half a dozen extra men on the job, Carol assured himself, for that's undoubtedly the time they would pick if they could get away with it. A single bomb then would do a pretty bit of damage. The evening brought no further developments, but shortly after midnight he determined to call the Renault, in the hope that the pretty telephone girl was still on duty and that she might finish telling him what she knew of Connors. Hotel Renock came a voice which he recognised instantly. "'This is Dave Carroll speaking,' said the operative. "'Can you tell me now what it was you started to say about Connors?' "'Not now,' came the whispered reply. Then, in a louder voice, "'Just a moment, please, and I'll see if he's registered.' During the pause which followed, Dave realised that the girl must be aware that she was watched by someone. "'Was it the silent moving head waiter?' "'No, he hasn't arrived yet,' was the next phrase that came over the wires, clearly and distinctly, followed by instructions couched in a much lower tone. "'Meet me. Drive entrance. One-five-sure.' 
and then a click as the plug was withdrawn. It was precisely five minutes past one when Carol paused in front of the Riverside Drive doorway to the Renault, considering it the part of discretion to keep on the opposite side of the driveway. A moment later a woman, alone, left the hotel, glanced around quickly and then crossed to where he was standing. "'Follow me up the street,' she directed in an undertone as she passed. "'Michael has been watching like a hawk.' Dave knew that Michael was the head waiter, and out of the corner of his eye he saw a shadow slip out of another of the hotel doorways farther down the drive and start toward them. But when he looked around a couple of blocks further up the drive, there was no one behind them. "'Why all the mystery?' he inquired as he stepped alongside the girl. "'Something's afoot in the Renault, she replied, "'and they think I suspect what it is and have told you about it. "'Mikhail hasn't taken his eyes off me all evening. "'I heard him boast one night that he could read lips, "'so I didn't dare tell you anything when you called up, "'even though he was across the lobby. "'Connor's the place you asked about is the Renock. "'Spell it backward. Connor is the manager. "'Hence the name of the hotel.' Then, said Carroll, that means that they have got a plan underway to bomb Lord Wimbledon and probably the British ambassador at that dinner tomorrow evening. I overheard one of them say last night that a bomb arranged to explode at the slightest pressure would be placed in the... And then he stopped. In the cake, gasped the girl, as if by intuition. But her next words showed that her deduction had a more solid foundation. This is to be a birthday dinner, in honour of Lord Percy somebody who's in Lord Wimbledon's party, as well as in honour of Lord Cecil. The pastry cook, who's almost certainly mixed up in the plot, has plenty of opportunity to put the bomb there, where it would never be suspected. The instant they cut the cake, but her voice trailed off in mid-air, as something solid came down on her head with a crash. At the same moment, Dave was sent reading by a blow from a blackjack, a blow which sent him spinning across the curb and into the street. He was dimly aware that two men were leaping towards him and that a third was attacking the telephone girl. Panting, gasping, fighting for time in which to clear his head of the effects of the first blow, Carroll fought cautiously but desperately, realising that his opponents desired to avoid gunplay for fear of attracting the police. A straight lift of the jaw caught one of the men coming in and knocked him sprawling, but the second, whom Carroll recognised as Mikel, was more wary. He dodged and fainted with the skill of a professional boxer, and then launched an uppercut which went home on the point of Dave's jaw. It was at that moment that the operative became aware of another participant in the fray, a figure in white, with what appeared to be a halo of gold around her head. The thought flashed through his mind that he must be dreaming, but he had sense enough left to leap aside when a feminine voice called, Look out! and the arc light glinted off the blade of a knife as it passed perilously close to his ribs. Then the figure in white brought something down on Mikel's head and, wheeling, seized the wrist of the third man in a grip of iron. Ten seconds later the entire trio was helpless and Carroll was blowing a police whistle for assistance. There was really nothing to it at all, protested the telephone girl during the ride in the patrol. They made the mistake of trying to let Felix, with his wounded hand, take care of me. I didn't have two years of gym work and a complete course in jiu-jitsu for nothing and that blackjack came in mighty handy a moment or two later. All Felix succeeded in doing was to knock my hat off, and I shed my coat the instant I had attended to him. That's why I thought you were a goddess in white, murmured Day. No goddess at all, just a girl from the switchboard who was glad to have a chance at the brutes. Anyhow, that few minutes beats any book I ever read for action. Day's hand stole out in the darkness as they jolted forward, and when it found what it was seeking... Girl, he said, do you realise that I don't even know your name? Lang, said a voice in the dark. My friends call me Virginia. After what you just did for me, I think we ought to be at least good friends, laughed Carol, and the thrill of the fight which had just passed 
was as nothing when she answered, At least that, Dave. Quinn paused for a moment to repack his pipe, and I took advantage of the interruption to ask what had happened at the Wimbledon dinner the following night. Not a thing in the world, replied Quinn. Everything went off like clockwork, everything but the bomb. As the Podunk Gazette would say, a very pleasant time was had by all. But you may be sure that they were careful to examine the cake and the other dishes before they were sampled by the guests. Michel, Felix and the cook were treated to a good dose of the third degree at headquarters, but without results. They wouldn't even admit that they knew any such persons as Number 859 or Von Ewald. The two of them got off with light sentences for assault and battery. The pastry cook, however, went to the pen when they found a quantity of high explosives in his room. And Miss Lang? If you care to look up the marriage licenses for October 1916, you'll find that one was issued in the names of David Carroll and Virginia Lang. She's the wife of a captain now, for Dave left the service the following year and went to France to finish his fight with the Hun. I saw him not long ago, and the only thing that's worrying him is where he is going to find his quota of excitement, for he says that there is nothing left in the service but chasing counterfeiters and guarding the resident, and he can't stand the idea of staying in the army and drawing his pay for wearing a uniform. End of The Girl at the Switchboard by William Nelson Taft Recording by Peter Tomlinson